Hello and welcome to the latest EnvCast episode. EnvCast is the Society for the Environment podcast, bringing you environmental professionals in conversation each month. I am Emma, the Chief Executive at the Society for the Environment. Our podcast is designed to provide insight into the lives of registered environmental professionals, featuring experts from across a wide range of sectors and disciplines. We explore what they do, why they do it, how they got to where they are now, and their future ambitions. Each guest is registered with us as a Chartered Environmentalist, Registered Environmental Practitioner, or Registered Environmental Technician via one of our professional body partners, known as our licensed members. As such, they have been externally verified to confirm they are committed to good practice in their environmental work. To learn more about the Society for the Environment, our environmental registrations, and our licensed members, please visit socemv.org.uk. So on today's EnvCast, I'm delighted to speak to Harry Seeley, Global Technology Lead, Sustainability and Climate for Jacobs in the Middle East. So um, good morning, Harry, and welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much, Emma. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, it's great to speak to you too. So Harry, can you start us off by telling us a little bit about your current role um, and your employer and what you do? Sure. I'm the, the Environment Sustainability Manager for Jacobs in Qatar which is where I've been since uh, 2012. Um, And I also have another role as part of our solutions and technology um, team as a global technical lead from a Middle Eastern perspective on the similar subject of sustainability and and climate change, climate action. Um, And in terms of my day, so that's part of my role. And the other part of my role is um, I am working as the technical director for environmental and social impact assessment across a range of projects and one of the the uh, the main giga projects in the kingdom of saudi arabia at the moment so uh, very exciting times yeah that sounds really interesting and very challenging um as well so just tell us a little bit um about some of the the tasks within your role the things that you do well, in terms of the GTL role, uh, that's basically providing feedback from the Middle East up the chain to Jacob's global corporate management team uh, in, to inform the, the corporate policy on climate action and sustainability strategy uh, across the, the, wider co- the wider company so that we have um, understanding from a regional perspective that feeds into the the wider corporate strategy and therefore you know we can plan our systems and services to our clients as well as our internal mechanisms to make sure that how we plan sustainability for the middle east is tailored appropriately and also um fits into the to the wider corporate strategy that uh, fits you know runs on a global scheme or a global scale so uh, that that's really exciting because it gives perspective to uh, from from myself on what's happening on a global level in the company and also from the the global level what's happening on a regional level so it's very much a a two-way street Um, and on the the giga project it's extremely exciting as i'm sure you've probably heard the scale of some of these projects that the kingdom is is developing um, as it plans its diversification away from uh, reliance on fossil fuels so the kingdom is developing these these very exciting uh, giga projects which the Frankly, the planet has never seen the like of ever before, um, but it gives an opportunity to really put sustainability and environmental management at the at the heart of of these projects, right from master planning all the way through to uh, the development of the the individual projects. Um, and our role on that is uh, supporting the client environment and sustainability team on uh, on strategizing and uh, looking at how to improve master planning and put things in place in terms of environmental social governments on, on projects, uh, get the environmental impact assessment correct right from the start and, and basically set the set the stage so that the, the, the development of these giga projects is done on a sound environmental footing that's tailored to the uh, what are quite extreme environmental conditions in the kingdom. That's, uh, that's really interesting. I mean, and obviously you've had um, quite an international role over your career. How does your kind of work now differ to um, to kind of other roles that you've had? So in the Middle East, with regards to environmental legislation, um, it has been evolving over the the last 10, 15, 20 years. Um, And it's it's understood that 
there are still opportunities for for improving legislation in the region. Indeed, there are efforts to to do that con, uh, consistently. But I think it's also fair to say that probably the uh, the the degree of evolution and maturity of environmental legislation in Europe and the UK is not necessarily the same as here in the region. Um, that said, the environmental challenges here in the region are, it could be argued, somewhat more extreme um, to, to the challenges that uh, Europe faces. So, for, for example, you know, extreme temperatures here in the region can get to 45, 50 and, and above, uh, which have consequences for, for various different uh, aspects of environmental design, building design. Uh, the, the biota, the, the habitats here are, are very much different as, as a result. The uh, state of recovery is very different in terms of responding to um, disturbance after, after developments. Uh, so all this has to, be, has to be taken into account. So the, the way you might assess impacts um, in terms of short, long-term and medium recovery in, in the UK and in Europe are very much different here in the region because the recovery times for, for natural habitats is so much longer. Um, so that you know, there's one of one of the the biggest lessons learned actually coming to the region is that you cannot, um, by any stretch of the imagination, just lift what works in the the European context, regardless of how developed we might think the legislation is, and and cookie cutter those practices into a Middle Eastern context. It just doesn't work. You can take some of the principles. Um, and run them through the, uh, the, the test bed of seeing whether they're actually appropriate to application in the Middle East. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very different environment and therefore um, deserves and demands uh, a different mindset and different perspective when we're setting out to, to manage um, environmental uh, aspects and impacts on, on projects and indeed the wider sustainability of the region. That's really, really interesting. And, and yeah, as you say that, um, embedded legislation in one area just it, it's not going to work somewhere else. That's that's really interesting. Um, I'm sure there's going to be lots of people listening to this who are really inspired by you and your work um, and are thinking about the impact that they'd like to have in their career. Can, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the requirements for the role, kind of what qualifications you you've had to do in the past, um, experience things like that? I guess one of the first things that comes to mind is. You need to have an open mind. Uh, you need to be very aware, just uh, connecting back to what I've just said a moment ago. Um, you need to be aware that if you've come from a European context uh, and you're used to that sort of um, principles, practices, approaches, that's good training. That's excellent training. And you know, some of the best, some of the international best practice obviously originates in this area. Uh, but best practice in as, as we've touched on before in the European or uh, US or Australian context is not necessarily best practice appropriate in, in the Middle East. So in terms of what you need is first and foremost, you need an open mind and, and to be uh, prepared to understand that there are other considerations over and above probably what you're either used to in your academic training or your professional experience so far. Um, and indeed, if you're a graduate from the region, then it's useful uh, to look at things from another perspective as well, such that there is an awful lot of really good international standards that have been developed in other uh, geographies um, that are willing to uh, that are that are um, very much worth consideration and close examination. But when you're implementing it in your country, you need to have the ability to understand and ask yourself the uh, almost like the so what question that uh, don't automatically assume that everything in a, in a particular international standard is, a, is directly applicable in, in your context. You need to have the ability to um, test run that within the context of, of your own environment. Um, so that, that's, that's one, one thing. The other thing I think that's really important is, um, and I'm not saying this simply because of the context of the Society of, of Environment interview now, but it's really important to ensure you maintain your continuing professional development, your CPD, and also towards building up your professional qualifications. After you leave university, that's when the real learning starts. Um, it's one of the things that uh, I remember. Um, I did marine biology in the University of Liverpool as my, my first degree, and then I went on to do an environmental master's with, with Southampton University. Um, 
And on graduation, you get this feeling of, you know, it's great, you've achieved something. And indeed you have, you know, it's been a lot of hard work over many years, hard night study, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of stress with exams and you come out with a qualification. It's a brilliant feeling. Um, but you also need to reality check yourself that, right, that was in, in some way, that was, that was quite a hard step to take. But there is an awful lot of learning ahead of you. And there's an awful lot of learning on the job. Um, and you need to be able to embrace that. But to help you guide through, uh, to, to help guide you through that process, it, it's also worth thinking about. Uh, okay, so what's next in terms of qualifications? Um, so whether it's a, a degree, a master's, a PhD, or some other uh, qualification that you've got, there's always something more you can do. And the beauty of the professional qualifications, and there's obviously an umbrella of them. Uh, uh, SOCEM provides an umbrella over multiple environmental institutes depending on what your, your leaning is. My own professional focus has been on IEMA because that's what's mostly um, appropriate for, for, for my career path. Um, depending on what your career path is, the institute might vary. But the bottom line is each one of those institutes has a very well-structured pathway of qualifications that if you follow, you'll just accelerate your career development um, and you'll understand what it is you need in terms of competencies, not just for your uh, development within your, your particular employer, because they'll obviously have their own competencies matrix on, on how to get up the ladder. But from a technical professional perspective, um, I think if you're not part of a professional uh, institute, you're, you don't have sight of that. And therefore, you're actually in, in some ways losing out. So that, that would be another key piece of advice would be to ensure you identify a professional institute, um, take out membership, look at what the career pathway is that uh, is, is uh, set out uh, by that professional institute and, and follow it as closely as you can. I think that's um, great advice, yeah, as well as that qualifications pathway that they all have, the uh, information, the support that you can get from them, that being part of a network and, and meeting and working with your peers exactly. is hugely valuable and they do a fantastic uh, job at that. So, um you told us a little bit about the work and um, some of the, the big projects that you're working on at the moment. Uh, what are the, some of the challenges that you've faced in doing that? That's a very good question. Um, don't assume that uh, everybody thinks the same way as you do. Uh, and don't assume that the way you're thinking is correct. Um, there are other perspectives, as I think is a, a bit of a common theme running through what, what, what we've been discussing so far. Um, but some, some of the challenges from moving out to the Middle East, uh, it, cultural, for sure. Uh, there's a very different way of doing business, um, which is much more focused on building personal relationships between people, um, building that trust, that respect, understanding uh, your client, um, on a personal level as well as a professional level, that's that's really important in in this part of the world. Um, so that that's that's one side the the cultural uh, business aspects and consideration. Um, the the second aspect I think that comes to mind is I, I guess a rather obvious one is the the extreme environment. You know, I'm, I'm based here in Qatar, but it's the same in, in many other countries in, in the region. You know, in the temperatures don't drop much below. I think the lowest we've ever had here is maybe about five degrees, six degrees. And I think that's happened for maybe one or two days over the last eight years. Um, the average temperature is in the high 20s, mid 30s. And then at this time of the year, you know, the average temperature is in the 40s up to the 50s. Um, although we've seen that happen in Canada over the last uh, week or so as well. So um, who, who knows what's in store in terms of the, the higher uh, end of extreme temperatures in the region. But basically, the, the, the extreme environment, uh, rainfall is literally counted in a couple of days a year. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it's no secret that, that has some, somewhat of an impact on the, um, on the natural environment and the, the, the habitats that are here. So in terms of the, the challenges of working from a practical point of view, doing field surveys in, in, the, in the height of the summer can be somewhat physically demanding. Um, in, in terms of the considerations um, and, and management for uh, looking at the mitigation measures for environmental management, for example, um, you can't automatically assume that um, for waste management, 
it's fine setting a, a, a target with, say, 95% diversion from, weapon, from landfill. But unless you've actually got quite a range of recycling facilities to, to support that and provide alternatives, it, 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 it cannot be assumed. Um, that was one of the, the luxuries, I guess, back in, back in the UK, that there's pretty much a, a well-developed infrastructure for, for most waste streams in terms of materials recycling and reuse. That's evolving here in the region. It's definitely a high priority, and there's definitely state-of-the-art facilities that have been built in, in the countries, um, but it's, it's a case of capacity. So uh, you know, more facilities need to be built, and, and certainly the theme of circular economy is becoming more and more prevalent here in, in the Middle East. Uh, in, in fact, it's, it's one of the, the fundamental concepts that's um, at the core of some of these giga projects that, that are being developed in the kingdom, but also in, in uh, other s- structures of governance in other countries in, in the GCC. Uh, so the, the awareness is there, but uh, the, it takes some time to put the same scale of facilities in place. So uh, that also is, is somewhat of a challenge that you've got to think about what the infrastructure is in place and plan your mitigation measures accordingly. Um, and also, I, I suppose one of the one of the challenges is um, to change the mindset. You know, you you need to um, as as part of working in these host nations, which is where we are. You know, you are a guest in these in these countries when you're working abroad. Um, it is your duty above and beyond the day job to to see what you can do to proactively support any initiatives, um, any conversations, any any seminars. Um, that are being hosted by by the country or indeed that you can proactively go out there and maybe set up uh, to encourage those conversations, to share information, to share knowledge uh, and not just sit back and say, well, you know, we, we just have to wait until uh, until the infrastructure develops. Well, no, get out there and be part of that conversation that's advising um, the, the stakeholders that are doing their best to try and develop that that infrastructure. What can you do to support them? Whether it be in the day job or whether it be on a, on a voluntary capacity, so there. But that, that in sense, that that's not a challenge actually. Uh, that's more of an opportunity um, because it gives you the the ability to feel as though you're you're really contributing properly to the society. You're not just doing your your day job and uh, and working on on a single project. You're actually seeing what more you can do to help the society and community that you're that you're part of. Yeah, that must be really rewarding. I mean, I mean, clearly, just from what you described, uh, you make a really big difference in your role. Um, do you feel like you make a difference in your role? Yes, I suppose um, there's always more you can do, um, which is why I, I suppose I sound somewhat hesitant when I said yes, but yes, I do. Um, and having those conversations with other stakeholders definitely you know, acts as a, a catalyst to them having other conversations that are related to that with other stakeholders. Um, and, and that's one of the things you need to be aware of that, uh, you know, a simple conversation you might have with one stakeholder might actually just be the spark that triggers a chain reaction of conversations with, that they might have that you might not have any visibility of with other stakeholders that might actually lead to something something bigger. Um, I think one of, one of the most rewarding uh, uh, aspects of the career that I've had so far in the region is being able to contribute to the development of, of regional standards and guidance for environmental management, um, taking it to, to the next level, uh, you know, evolving and developing um, regulations, for example, that um, are now being implemented that, you know, that makes it even more robust um, for, for future generations or future projects in 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 uh, in the country, so that that is one thing that I'm I'm quite proud of. Um, so yes, I mean I, I think you know it's it's not a case of making um, uh, seismic changes uh, in in one particular project. I think it's more about um, having the awareness to know that it's it's uh, it, it's every change, no matter how small, is a change, and as long as you make that change for the better. Then you're contributing to to the wider development of uh, this tr- transition to sustainability, um, and there's definitely, most definitely, an awakening in in especially in the last uh, three years, three four years um, in in the region here. We we see clients requiring things like um, demonstrating that we're uh, providing services for for net gain, or uh, you see phrases of um, clients requiring natural capital. 
um, or demonstration of how to have guidance on uh, ecosystem services, um, which was never part of the request for, for proposal, uh, we'll say four or five years ago. Now it's becoming more standard. Um, and that's extremely encouraging. That's wow. very, very encouraging. So I'm not saying that I've personally necessarily had something to do with that, but uh, you know, I'm one of very many environmental professionals in, in the region. Uh, and collectively, this is something that is happening. And uh, what, we, what we do see actually is um, you, you see the movement of some environmental professionals into now quite significant roles uh, in, in some major projects. Um, and you know that they are also driving the, the text in the requirements that are being set for job descriptions, for example, um, and for tender documentations. Um, that you can see and certainly a, a, a quite a significant increase in the, the standard of requirements that's coming through. Whereas before, nobody was necessarily requiring a professional membership of an organization to, to apply for a job role. That's changing now. You know, now, now when we're asked for um, teams to support some of these projects or, you know, we, we're required to put forwards teams on uh, for, for the delivery of, of services, uh, more and more now we're seeing client organizations specifying in the, the job descriptions of the candidates they want you to provide on these jobs that professional membership of an associated um, institute is required. Yeah, uh, yeah, we, we're seeing that more and more as well with people specifying uh, CM um, as part of jobs, which is encouraging because we want exactly we want competent people making those decisions and being involved in those projects. So that's really encouraging. Um, exactly. and, and I completely agree with you. Lots of little changes really mount up to, to something quite substantial. Um, Correct. So that, yeah, I completely agree. So you did marine biology uh, for your first degree, as you said before. When did you kind of first develop awareness for the environment? When I was five years old and had my face buried in a rock pool with my grandfather's old diving mask. Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> um, that was one. And another, another memory I have was um, I was about seven years old and I was absolutely heartbroken um, standing by the hedgerow watching the bulldozers come in and level what had been my, my playground, which was a field, a site next to where we lived. Um, just leveled it to brown earth within within a day and i just remember thinking what could i do to stop that um and I, I, like i said i was seven years old i said that's not right how can they damage the environment that and i didn't even know the environment even existed as a word then obviously but just the concept of of watching that scale of to me complete devastation because that, that was where I crawled amongst the long grass, you know, looking for spiders and ants and, you know, watching ant nests and chasing birds of various different species. It, it was basically, it was my, my uh, go-to happy place, you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was devastating when I watched it just be turned into a, uh, a brown earth within a matter of hours. So I, I think those two things um, crossed my mind as, as being the... the uh, points of origin. I remember in my class when I was, I suppose, about eight or nine years old, I remember our, our class teacher asking us, so lads, any idea what you want to be? And I was in a, an all-boys Catholic school in, in Cork, um, where I'm from originally. And uh, I suppose a lot of the lads would have said, uh, you know, a dentist or a farmer or a doctor or an engineer or something like that. And I said, um, a zoologist. And the, the teacher was kind of taken aback and said, oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was a bit interesting explaining to another class of nine-year-olds what a zoologist was. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess I was quite lucky in the sense that I knew from literally that age that my, my life was going to be anchored in some way or another to uh, environmental sciences or environmental management. Yeah, that's brilliant. And, and we're, again, more and more people are having that awareness because the environment is so much more prominent to people now and they're so much more aware um, I'm sure you talking here is really going to inspire some people in the future to actually recognise the career that you can have as well um, and the, the really uh, big impact that you can make from having that professional career in the environment. So, I think one, um, of the, one, one of the, just, just on that though, Emma, I think it's, it's, it's worthwhile mentioning that um, one of the dynamics we've seen in the last couple of years that we've never seen before 
is the the power of the voice of the youth. Um, you know, the, the likes of, obviously, Greta Thunberg comes to mind, but there are so many more Greta Thunbergs out there in every single country. Um, and the, 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 the kids, the youth of, of, uh, of the generations of, the, of, of the, the current times, they are having uh, an incredible impact on awareness. So what, what the um, environmental NGOs um, have in, in some way had limited success in doing in terms of building public awareness on the real risks of climate change for many years. And it's not for the want of trying, uh, but for some reason we just switched off as societies to these warnings that scientists have been giving us since the 80s, actually, to, to be fair. Um, and, and what these student marches did in, in, the, in the space of 18 months. And uh, unfortunately, um, you know, the, this, this horrible pandemic that's affected so many lives so, with such devastating consequences interrupted that to, to an extent. But, uh, you know, I think the, the youth of today are, are really stepping up to the market. They are providing a step change in awareness that was never there before. And, you know, it couldn't happen sooner. I mean, realistically speaking, we're probably about 30 years behind where we need to be in terms of climate action. It's not to say that we can't, we can't get there. It would be nice to have started 30 years ago. Um, but the, the, in some ways, I'm enthused by, I take inspiration from the, from the youth and the, the younger generations of, of today. Um, because, yeah, we have to get our job right now if, if my kids and my grandkids and those kids that we're seeing marching in the streets um, have uh, had a chance in trying to have a, a decent quality of life that's not going to be impacted by, by the devastation of, of climate change. So, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. I think they are so inspirational. And, and my hope is that a, a proportion of those young people see the career opportunities and actually see the difference that they can make um, as environmental professionals and take that forward. And those who have a different career path um, also understand the difference that they can make by having that environmental awareness in their work as well as their home life as well. Correct. Um, because there's so, so yeah, many, diff so many different aspects to that. Because even if you want to become an economist today, say you're, you're not interested in, in, in the, you know, the, the ecology of an ant nest, for example, um, and you're much more interested in finances and uh, economic mechanisms, it still comes back to the same thing at the end of the day. You know, the, the green bonds market, the, the, the green finances, uh, everything in, in economics is turning to, you know, what is sustainable financially. Um, and it all comes down to what are sound financial investments. Uh, so no matter what career path people take nowadays, in one way or another, they will be contributing in some um, significant way to the overall effort to get us off this horrible trajectory that we're on at the moment for, uh, for climate change. So I think that's, that's an important point to make that um, environmental management is not just about doing an environmental sciences degree. There are so many different uh, aspects to it across in law, for example, we, we've seen um, finally, we've seen legislation start to, to hit some of the senior law courts now in terms of ecocide, you know, there, there's, we need every different sort of uh, discipline um, and, and training and, uh, and vocation to collectively make a change on the planet for, for the better. It's not just about, if you like, the, uh, what comes to mind maybe immediately in terms of environmental scientists. Yeah, I, I, I so agree with you. Um, I've talked to you about that for, for hours. Um, so just tell us a little bit about what being a chartered environmentalist means to you. You talked about um graduating from university and then that's the kind of then where that professional work starts um but actually kind of getting that cm what, what does that mean to you it's um it's a milestone in your career isn't it um it, it's it's getting i guess recognition professionally for everything you've worked so hard to do to get to that point in your career so from a personal point of view, that, that for me was uh, one of the highlights of my career was getting that uh, SOC M certificate through the, through the door, um, which, which was great. It was absolutely, you know, it was, it was a real thrill um, because that, that's down to you as an individual. Um, it, you've done that. Nobody's given it to you. Um, it's recognition for what you've achieved. Um, so, and, and also in, in terms of... Um, 
what it means to to the wider professional market. You know, it, it, it to an extent, it, it's a bit like um, having a, an engineer that's a chartered engineer. You know, it just it's just that level of confidence that you know that that person has been through the mill to try and get that uh, that that chartership for for engineering. I mean, you know, I've, I've worked shoulder to shoulder with engineering colleagues most of my career, and um, you know the, the the work that they also go through to to get the the uh, chartered engineering um, status is is very significant. And in terms of uh, chartership in the environmental, as a chartered environmentalist, um, I think there's growing recognition as well that um, it requires somebody not just to have a particular depth in one particular um, technical aspect. Somebody that's a chartered environmentalist has. Uh, that's required to have, must have um, a much wider awareness and perspective of, of topics. They might have one specific area that they're you know, a specialist in, uh, but they also have that, that wider general awareness of, um, of, of other key topics um, on the, the, the bigger spectrum of environment sustainability. So, yes, it's, and also I guess it, it, sets, the, um, it sets the course for what's the next step. You know, what more can you do beyond, beyond chartered? Uh, to to go up to you know be, uh, fellowship for example and and beyond, so yeah for for me personally it was a milestone um, of of achievement. Yeah, it's great to hear you say that. I mean, for me, it's it absolutely demonstrates that that level of technical competence, that um, underpinning knowledge, the application, and that breadth. But but also really important for me is that it's demonstrated how how people are going to work because you signed a code of professional conduct. Right. As a chartered environmentalist, people can be confident, not that you've got the underpinning kind of knowledge and experience, but also how you're going to work and the professionalism that you'll bring to the role and the accountability that comes with that as well, I think is, is really, really important. I couldn't agree more. And it, it is maybe one of the challenges that um, environmental sustainability professionals have working in other geographies um, in, internationally, where maybe the... Um, the, the level of awareness at a, a national standards level or you know, just the general uh, dynamics in, in that part of the world are not so focused on the importance of, of environmental management. Um, and quite often it will come down to the person that's responsible for leading, let's say, an environmental impact assessment. Um, you, know, you, you need to be aware that the findings of your environmental impact assessment are the findings of your environmental impact assessment, even if it's somewhat inconvenient to the client organization, that might mean that they need to spend more on mitigation measures, or maybe they need to move the location of the development, or they need to do something that was um, that is from a commercial and a time perspective of some inconvenience. Um, you need to be aware that what, well, there's two sides of it, right? You need to be aware of the context and make sure that the findings that you have, you keep in context. So you don't necessarily blow out of proportion some, some finding. Um, so you as a professional have a responsibility to make sure that you set the criteria correctly and that it's, it's, uh, it's set up properly from that perspective. Um, but equally, if you do find um, uh, fi uh, uh, aspects of significance that it's not just if you like swept under the carpet or dismissed or um, as sometimes can happen the client will come back and say well we don't really like the way that this is written can you possibly change it uh, and the simple answer is an environmental professional if you think that your finding is correct and uh, it's inappropriate to if you like downplay or um, or, or, or categorize the the level of impact at a lower category just because that's what the client wants then this is where your environmental ethics come in. No, sorry, this is where your professional ethics come in. This is where your your uh, code of practice comes in as a as a member of an institute like SOCEN, for example, um, and and that can be a pressure. That can be a pressure, uh, and this is where it's also very useful to to know that you have the backing of a, of a professional institute, um, just so you can bounce maybe a, a, an issue off them uh, if it, if it gets particularly complicated that you know you can potentially ring up somebody in IEMA obviously not divulge information on the project because that's um, uh, potentially in conflict with uh, client confidentiality uh, but that you have a mechanism there that you can bounce off ideas off other professionals uh, to, to, to see what they think and, and um, just to sense check that what you're thinking of is is correct. 
yeah, as we said before, the um, the the networking that comes and the benefits have come with those professional bodies. Uh, again, just another great example of that. So thank you for that. Um, so you've talked lots about the work that you're that you've been doing over the last twelve years and the kind of great projects that you're working on now. What what comes next? What's the future aspiration for you? That's <laughs> that that's a very difficult question. <laughs> um, I guess in 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 this career, it, it's it's almost like an evolution from one stage to the next. Uh, as as mega trends develop, uh, it, it's a case of keeping on top of that and um, assimilating and understanding the the driving force behind those mega trends, and to be able to inform and educate educate yourself continuously, and also lead others into the importance of of that. For example, one. Um, one concept at the moment that's, uh, I guess, pretty well established in the UK and uh, and emerging here now is the concept of digital EIAs. So, uh, you know, this concept of having um, uh, moving more to the digital media when uh, when you're doing uh, uh, ESIAs, I should say. Um, so, so that's one one concept that's uh, certainly on the horizon. The other aspect as well is understanding the importance of influencing uh, sustainability strategizing at corporate level um, in client organizations because if you can if you can influence that it means that you can influence potentially their their requirements on tenders for the next development which means if you can influence what goes into their tender documentation you can directly influence the quality of environmental performance of the of, of a project some of these projects can be 10 15 20 years long and therefore you're making a real significant uh, change in in terms of protecting the the natural environment and on optimizing sustainability and not just environmental sustainability but financial and social you know uh, uh, the wider holistic concept of sustainability so in terms of what's next i mean it's it's just about trying to um keep at the at the front edge of of that thought leadership um and uh, and that's exciting it's like surfing the front of a wave at the moment in terms of climate action because there are so many different aspects all coming together now uh it, it really is a different environment now and i don't know whether you, you you'd share that opinion Emma, but it just seems that we're in a in a different era thankfully very very positively but i think in a very different era to where we were for example 10 years ago uh, i i couldn't agree more it's just yesterday was my anniversary being with the society uh, for six years and even in that time it's changed massively from environment almost being an afterthought in some instances to now being almost the most important thing almost the first thing that people are thinking of which is brilliant um Correct. but it's really important that as we've talked a lot about professionalism that we're really um embedding and helping and supporting and make sure that people have the right support to make those decisions um in the right way for the long term as well so yeah i couldn't agree more so I'm going to finish on a really big question. We like to finish on a big one. So um, if you were able to influence world leaders for a day, what would be the first thing that you would do? Yeah, it is a big question, isn't it? <laughs> um, I, I know this sounds like we're, we're going back to uh, highlighting the negatives, but I, I think we really do need to understand that uh, the urgency in taking action, and you know, the Amazon forest is still being devastated every single day. You know, the there is huge damage done to the seabed every single hour by bottom trawling, for example. I know these are somewhat controversial topics because obviously they're impacting somebody's livelihood somewhere that's 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 relying on these industries for their for their income, for their families, for their families' education. But there is another way. There has to be another way. Uh, so in, t in terms of world leaders, I would love to, to take them. It would probably take more than one day, to be fair. But I, I would love to take them on a, on, on a personal tour of drop them into the middle of the Amazon, um, show them exactly what is going on, uh, put them in the middle of a palm oil um, plantation so there they can see as far as the eye can see this monoculture where the rainforest used to be you know put them into the middle of one of these the, these mines where there's just huge devastation or put them into the middle of uh, you know what I mean put put them in the context of reality of what's actually going on in the natural environment uh, because they don't they don't see it firsthand ever 
You know, it's it's just a document that lands on their desk, and they, you know, their their advisors tell them how bad it is. So if we could put all the world leaders together, and and tell them, you know, this is what's happening, and what you're doing is not good enough. We we've seen it, we've seen the trillions, uh, the trillions of dollars that somewhat magically appeared to fight this horrible pandemic. You know, the the environmental cause, the climate action cause, only needs a fraction of that necessarily. To, to make a step change in, in what actually needs to be done. Uh, so what that proved to me was where there's a will, there's a way. You know, it, it's not, there's no good saying that you don't have the finances to, to, to fund this. You don't have the finances not to fund it because the, the devastation that's going to happen um, if we don't get this right. Thankfully, we're moving in the right way, um, albeit very, very slowly. So, yeah, that, that would be my, my rather long-winded short answer yeah. is just to... Yeah, brilliant. And to know that really... That really made me reflect on the answer that you gave earlier. What was your first awareness of the environment? So we almost need those world leaders standing in front of that hedge and turning it to kind of brown, brown dirt. I, I think that's a yes, a really powerful, powerful idea. If only we could make that happen. Um, you. Harry, thank you so much. That's been so interesting. Um, I'm sure you're going to inspire lots of other people with this as well. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Emma, and, and to the society the, for the environment as well for this opportunity. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. If you are curious to hear more about the Chartered Environmentalist, Registered Environmental Practitioner and Registered Environmental Technician Registers, please take a look at our How to Become and Why Become recorded webinars on our website, socenv.org.uk. Or you can find them on our YouTube channel, Society for the Environment, where you will also find a variety of topical environmental webinars and various different insights from registrants. You can also follow us on Twitter at SOCEMV underscore HQ to keep up to date with all of the Society's latest news. We will release a new episode on the first Wednesday of each month. So if you're interested in our future podcasts, please subscribe to hear more from us. You can subscribe and review through a variety of platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify and CastBox. Thank you for listening or watching on YouTube. We're looking forward to the next episode next month.